Hello, I'm Mr. Johnston, and this is Biology. Welcome to section 1.12, covering proteins for biology. Uh, so we're on a third macromolecule here, or our third polymer, our third large molecule that we'll have that's organic. We've covered carbohydrates, we've covered lipids, on each of those have their own purposes. You have energy storage and structure that you have with the uh, carbohydrates. And when you have lipids, you have a lot of stuff with our cell membranes. You have transport as far as signals with uh, steroids. Uh, you have lots of energy storage with long-term fats. Now proteins, though, will probably be the most diverse of all the groups of macromolecules. They are going to do more stuff than any of the other macromolecules that we talk about. Now that doesn't mean that the other ones aren't important. Obviously, you have phospholipids in our cell membranes that are critical. DNA and nucleic acid is critical. Uh, but proteins just do a ton of stuff. So if you're ever in doubt and I'm asking you about something a macromolecule does, your best bet is probably to guess proteins if you don't know it. Because these guys really are what controls the most about who we become at a molecular level. You know, what color, what texture, what structure, what chemical reactions most of that's going to come back to proteins. So this will be an important one. Now proteins are going to be a polymer and they're going to be made up of amino acids. So you'll see that the amino acid will be the monomer and there are 20 different types. They all have a similar structure. Uh, they'll have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Most of them have sulfur. Uh, but these amino acids will differ. They've got this kind of region called the R group that varies based upon which of the 20 amino acids it is. And so this gives us quite a lot of options because you can have anywhere from you know, tens of amino acids to in some cases you could have potentially up to the thousands of amino acids in a single protein. And so because you can have so many and each one can be one of 20 different things, this gives you a ridiculously high amount of possibilities. If you look at a phone number, you've got 10 options, zero to nine for each of the number slots. And when you look at a seven digit phone number, where it's essentially like for us, uh, you'd probably be t looking at something that's, well, if it's like the school, three, six, five, blah, 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 four more numbers, uh, that's a seven digit number overall. And if my math works right, I, I believe that works out to be there's about a million numbers that you can give out just with those seven different slots for the numbers and 10 possibilities per slot. And so it's kind of cool, and that actually works out 10 to the 7th is how you work that out. Whereas with if you have a protein that's ultimately a thousand long, and there's 20 possibilities each, I mean that gets to be an incredibly high number of possibilities that you can get. And so this is one of the reasons that we can get so much diversity in life, is that if we do have where there's this change and we get new proteins, there's so many possible proteins, and if you get a new protein, it typically will have a different function from most of the other ones. Uh, you can even stumble upon multiple ways of doing the same thing, thing uh, same function with different versions of proteins. So they don't even have to be related. Uh, you can have where different organisms stumble upon the same function, but they stumble upon it with a different protein, once again, because the amazing number of possibilities. So if you see sulfur, that's kind of a, a big key that it's likely going to be a protein in general because they are more prone to have sulfur than any of the other ones we talk about. And once again, they also will have nitrogen. So we already said lipids and carbohydrates had the CHO part, but the nitrogen and the sulfur will typically let you know that this specifically is going to be a protein. Now in the next section, just to make sure we're comfortable, when you take a bunch of amino acids and stick them together, we call that polymer, usually a polypeptide is, is the most proper term, uh, but one or more polypeptides stuck together make up a protein. So it's kind of an odd thing where a protein is one or more polypeptides stuck together. And the reason this can work is you can kind of make several different chunks of amino acids and you can affix those separate chunks together to make up one large protein. So polypeptide for our purposes will be used largely interchangeably, uh, but in general just keep in mind a protein is going to be one or more polypeptides together. Uh, there'll be lots of proteins that are actually like four polypeptides will be a kind of common thing with collagen, hemoglobin, uh, different proteins that we have but they're all going to be polymers. The other thing I want you to realize is peptide is going to be kind of like saccharide was sugar, saccharide was carb. In this case, anything peptide is going to be protein. 
So a polypeptide is going to be ultimately many peptides. What we mean by that is many amino acids bonded together. Uh, you'll see sometimes they'll call these bonds between amino acids. They'll call those peptide bonds. It's really just a covalent bond. They just give it a fancy name because it's binding to amino acids. So anything with peptide in it is going to be referring to proteins. And so you'll see these amino acids, and it's kind of listed some of them. Uh, you don't have to memorize the actual names, but these can be different types. And they're just going to bind to each other in this long chain. And this will be the simplest structure of a, a polypeptide or a protein. It's going to be this long chain of bonded amino acids. And um, we'll talk about the different levels of structure on the next slide. But the idea here I want to make sure you get is the monomer is amino acids. The polymer is a polypeptide or a protein. But to get from one to the other, you can stick a bunch of amino acids together. You can stick a bunch of monomers together, and you will get a polymer. You will get a polypeptide. And you can also break down a polypeptide, and you can break it down into its individual amino acids or its monomers. So this process is not just like, a, like one of them is completely brand new. It's just if you take a bunch of monomers, we can add those together to get the polymer, but we can also go back. We can also break it down to go back to being a monomer. So we talked about like the Lego idea, that the Lego is the monomer, stick a bunch together, we get the polymer. So if the Lego is an amino acid, the Lego castles the protein, but I can also break the castle back down into individual Legos. I can break the protein back down into individual amino acids. And that's largely what would happen during digestion. And then structures, one of the key things about protein is their shape or sometimes called conformation, you might see that, that word used, put that down here at the bottom here, is what determines their function. So if you want to kind of know how a protein is going to work, it's because of that shape, that three-dimensional conformation that they have. And that's going to depend upon these four levels of structure, three of which you have to have, the fourth will be optional. The primary structure is just the bonded amino acid. That's all that is. It's this long string of amino acids Nothing fancy done, it's just a string of amino acids. So that'll be the primary where it just kind of looks like that, those beads on a string again, if you will. When those long strings start to interact with each other and they form like helixes or those pleated sheets, they start to kind of form these shapes, we call that the secondary structure. And then when these shapes, when these kind of organized strings, if you will, that have, have configured themselves into basic shapes start to interact, we get this complex 3D structure called tertiary. And this should make sense. Primary basically means one, secondary two, tertiary means three, and quaternary will mean four. So they're really just telling you what level. So the tertiary is where we start to see this 3D shape come in. And all structures that are proteins will have at least primary, secondary, and tertiary. We specifically call the tertiary structure a polypeptide. That's where that term comes from. Now, some structures will be quaternary as well. So this one's going to be kind of optional. Uh, and the way this works is if you're made of more than one polypeptide, so if you're made of two plus polypeptides, you will have a quaternary structure, which is just where those separate tertiary units bind together. And once again, you're just going to get a slightly more elaborate 3D shape because it's a bunch of 3D shapes that are kind of sticking together. So not all proteins have to have a quaternary structure. They only have one if there's more than one polypeptide involved. All right, moving on. So protein function, uh, some of the things we'll use proteins for. A lot of proteins are going to be structural, so they will help out in cell shape. You can see a lot of cells can ultimately like stretch themselves out. Uh, some things like amoebas can actually like throw parts of themselves almost forward that they use to drag themselves along. Uh, you'll have proteins that will change shape like flagella or cilia, which are like little oars or tails to a cell that can be used to propel the cell. So there's lots of stuff to do with cell shape. You also have structural ones that will be used, and some of those will be just like the shape ones. They can be used there, but they can be used for like rigidity. So you've got like muscles will ultimately have these structural guys that can contract and can tug that cell to be shorter and then the whole muscle gets tugged to be shorter and so it can pull on your bones and actually move your arms and so you'll have a muscle that's up on the top here that tugs it up and you'll have one on the back that tugs it back down and so that allows us to move uh, there's other structural ones that we can have as well you've got things like collagen that holds things in place like your skin that's why a lot of uh, creams will have collagen in them 
I don't know that rubbing a bunch of collagen on your face actually does anything uh, because I don't know that it gets absorbed and used by your body. But the idea there is that there is scientific evidence that collagen does hold your skin in place. And so a lot of beauty companies say, well, we added collagen because collagen holds your skin in place. And so they're hoping that you just assume it's going to go through your skin, somehow grab hold of the skin and tug it up, if you will. Uh, but we've got lots of stuff with our bones that's there that gives it that flexibility. If you've ever like had a chicken or something else where you can take the bones and they flex a bit, uh, that's because of the proteins that they're made of. Your hair, there's lots of stuff there that's going to be more or less just a structural protein. And then we've got enzymes which are going to be used to, to what we call catalyze. And what this really just means is to kind of make it easier, is what the simple terms are, um, to allow reactions to occur. And so this will catalyze chemical reactions in our body. If I can spell here. Uh, and so this is important because when we're digesting food, when we're trying to build molecules in our body, we're going to use these enzymes to make it just a bit easier. Because whenever you want to do a chemical reaction, you normally have to give it some energy first. It's kind of like when you're starting a fire, you have to first light that match and put it down there and heat it up before the fire will go on its own. And so it's the same idea with enzymes where they make it easier for something to light. So it's kind of like putting lighter fluid where you still need the match, but it's a heck of a lot easier to get it to light once you get that match there. And so enzymes will be used to catalyze a whole bunch of reactions. And we've got where each reaction normally needs its own enzyme, which has its own specific shape. And so if you mess up even a single enzyme, it can in some cases be lethal if it's a critical one. And you have thousands of enzymes. So this is where with natural selection, you can see that someone could have some minor changes to some of their enzymes. And based upon if those made the enzymes better or worse, that could impact your survival very easily. And then lastly, we'll see that some of our hormones will be used. Uh, and they'll typically be proteins. Uh, so there will be some what they call peptide hormones, that idea of proteins. Uh, some things like insulin and glucagon, those are the guys that raise and lower your blood sugar they're ultimately going to be a peptide hormone, so that would help with the messages. And you'll also see transport where there's some proteins, like we'll talk about hemoglobin on the next page, uh, but that ultimately are able to help us move stuff around the body. In the case of hemoglobin, it binds oxygen. It then carries that oxygen from the lungs elsewhere in our body, drops off that oxygen, and has some role too in grabbing CO2 and bringing it back to the lungs where it can get rid of the CO2 so that we can exhale it as it grabs oxygen again. So there's going to be a whole bunch of functions. Pigments and colors are also a protein function. There's lots and lots of functions that proteins have, and they're very critical to us. So even small changes in your DNA, which if you remember, your DNA is what codes for protein. So that's going to be where this code that says, here's the blueprint as to what one to build. If you change that, even small changes can have a big effect over what you actually can do and what you look like. And that obviously can affect your survival once again. And then some examples, uh, we do have where proteins are important as far as diet. There are some amino acids that are essential amino acids. Anything that says essential, whether it's a fatty acid, an amino acid, really what that means is we have to eat it. It's not something that we can make on our own. And so there are amino acids that we have to be very careful to make sure that our diet contains or else we can have problems that we would essentially call malnourishment where it's not necessarily a calorie issue, it's not so much an energy issue, but if you're lacking these amino acids, we can't build the proteins that we need to function properly. Uh, lipase is just a sample enzyme. This one, you'll see the ACE ending typically just means enzyme. And then the light part tells us who. So in this case, this would be just a basic lipid enzyme. So it's breaking down lipids. So this would be lipid breakdown, if we will, as I smash that close together. Uh, so lipid breakdown would be lipase. Antibodies, these are small molecules that are ultimately going to make, obviously, proteins. Uh, we call them immunoglobulins, the fancy term if you like. Uh, but these ones will be used for recognition. Uh, so we ultimately are going to recognize certain antigens. These are going to be anything in our body that we think is not supposed to be there, anything foreign. And we can produce these antibodies in response to them, which can then mark those guys, the, the bacteria, the virus, whatever it is, they can then mark it. And in some cases, these guys will actually kill whatever it is that we're after. So they'll kill whatever uh, antigen, uh, which essentially I can just write like foreign object or cell. So in some cases, they'll kill it. And in some cases, they'll just mark it. And then 
after it's marked, there can be other cells that will come through and destroy it. Uh, and so this would be like your white blood cells can eat it. You have some other cells called lymphocytes that can kind of poke holes in it. Uh, but it allows us to make sure that we can keep our body in peak condition. And, and it's really how our immune system works. This is how we make sure that we don't accidentally let something harmful sneak into our bodies and cause harm. And so we do this by anybody that seems not to be supposed to be there. We take them out. And that typically will result in their destruction if they're chemical. Can't really kill them if it's just like a virus. Uh, but destroying it, or in the case of something like an actual cell, like a bacteria or a fungus or a protist, will ultimately just kill it. And so that way it can't harm us. And then hemoglobin is the one we talked about before, where basically this one's going to carry oxygen. Uh, and in some cases, it'll have a small role too in carrying carbon dioxide from the lungs to the body. And so that's their basic task is in our blood, this hemoglobin is the one that actually contains iron. So when they talk about having iron because your blood uh, is low in iron, that's the basic idea is if you don't have enough iron, we can't make enough hemoglobin. If we don't have enough hemoglobin, you're going to have difficulty having enough of these molecules to grab oxygen and grab CO2 and ferry them in between the cells in your body and the cells in your lungs. And if that happens, you're going to start to get essentially tired, uh, weak, because you're lacking oxygen. You're not able to do everything you'd like to because we need oxygen to break stuff down and get ourselves energy to generate the ATP that our body needs to function. Hope you guys enjoyed this. This wraps up proteins, and we'll wrap up nu uh, nucleic acids next time, and that should be it for the macromolecules. See you soon.